Um, welcome, my name is Rose. Welcome to From Recalls to Revisionist History. Um, we're gonna talk about today how from the pushback against ethnic studies to the recall of Chesa Boudin, the right has been relentlessly creating opportunities to stoke backlash against a progressive agenda throughout the Bay Area. We're coming into this panel with the overarching question of how can the organized left mobilize support to protect progressive political wins and counteract the right's local agenda? Um, and part of that is gonna be understanding who are the actors who are shaping that agenda here and how they're doing it. So we're interested in understanding how the different backlashes to progressive wins might be connected to one another and also to fights in other places, but also how the players and the opposition might be different um, and may include not only the far right, um, but also moderate forces here. And before we start, I just want to, you know, clarify that um, that Joyce, Emily, and Amy aren't here because they represent the only issues or communities where this right-wing backlash is taking place, but because they're working on three really important fights um, and we wanna to get to learn from their leadership. So I'm gonna introduce them. I'm, I've abbreviated the bios a little bit, but they have long, impressive bios in your program. So feel free to find them there. Um, I guess I'll just go down the line. So Emily Lee, is a leader in electoral organizing with expertise in many other things that you can read about in the program. Um, she worked at the Chinese Progressive Association for 10 years. Emily also helped to co-found Bay Resistance in 2017 and seed the vote in 2020 to help ensure a Trump defeat and is currently the co-director at San Francisco Rising. Joyce Lamb leads CPA's communications work and builds with movement allies and directs political campaigns. Previously, Joyce led the tenant Worker Center at CPA, where she oversaw organizing campaigns and community outreach. And Amy Richel has been a history and social studies educator for SFUSD since 2006. Um, she's taught ethnic studies for over 10 years and was a core member of SFUSD's Ethnic Studies Curriculum Committee. She's also taught at San Francisco State and acted as a consultant to schools who are creating ethnic studies programs. Um, let's, give, let's give a round of applause. For So we'll have you three each start by just giving us an overview of your area of work. And so as part of that, if you could do a few things, if you can help frame the context for the work. So what are some of the conditions that led to all of this happening now? Um, second, name the opposition. So both the ideologies at play and how that's been adapted um, by right-wing forces and to what end and who else has been caught up in that. And then a little bit about just the arc of your work and the current status. Um, and we can just go down the line. So Emily, you wanna kick it off? Sure. Um, might need to look at your notes for there. <laughs> uh, so I'm just gonna go a little bit over the landscape. Um, as you can see, it's kind of an overwhelming collage of <laughs> different elected officials, um, organizations. Um, and it's just to help us make a little bit of understanding of who supported who opposed the recall of Chase of Boudin last year. Um, can I ask how many people here are San Francisco voters? Very impressed. Thanks for trekking out from across the Bay. And don't leave San Francisco, please. <laughs> um, so you can see from the slide, you know, kind of, there's a lot of local elected officials. So for people who aren't familiar with San Francisco politics, I'll just kind of go through batches of them. Um, but I'll start with the kind of who is for, who is really funding and supporting and pushing the narrative for the recall. Um, so I'll start with um, Leanna Louie on the far right. Uh, and Joyce here can talk more about the Chinese right wing, but Leanna Louie was one of the main spokespeople for the recall. And she had made a lot of contact with Chinese families, Asian um, families who had been victims of violence in San Francisco. and Basically, she was using that, that was kind of the central wedge that was being used to com uh, pit communities of color against each other and to kind of uh, provide the rationale that Chase Boudin is directly responsible for attacks on Asian elders. Um, those people who attacked those vulnerable people are walking scot-free, they're allowed to commit crimes again, uh, that he is all about supporting, because he was a former public defender, he's all about supporting criminals, right? And that's who he cares about. He doesn't care about victims of crime. 
Um, so she was a very loud, outspoken person um, and is considered definitely on the right of kind of the Chinese community. And I think Joyce will talk more about how, what that community looks like, but she was definitely the right wing of it um, and was a central um, spokesperson for the recall. Um, the other kind of, uh, you know, really right wing forces, obviously the San Francisco Republican Party, um, they actually started their own version of a recall drive. So they started a petition, obviously in San Francisco, the majority of people are not Republicans. They're actually uh, registered Democrats or independents. And so the Democratic, um, sorry, the Republican Party and their spokesperson, Richie Greenberg, had been pushing for this um, same, you know, very similar arguments, you know, um, that he, that Chase Boudin is a right, as a left-wing radical, his parents were criminals. Um, so they really used his family's past as also something to um, kind of peak national right-wing interest on him actually, and to target him and turn out um, neo-Nazis and right-wing activists to protest him. Uh, and so the Republican party um, knew, I think we all, everybody in San Francisco knew pretty quickly that wasn't gonna go anywhere. They didn't have the, to, to frame it as a Republican recall was not gonna work for a lot of people. And so you had actually this marriage of the right wing forces in San Francisco, coupled with moderate Democrats like Mary Jung and Andrea Shorter. Um, Mary Jung is used to be the former uh, lobbyist for the Realtors Association in San Francisco. She was, I think, the former chair of the local Democratic Party in San Francisco. So moderate Democratic kind of, you know, machine. Um, they started their own recall um, petition drive, which was much more successful and which actually garnered the signatures needed to get it on the ballot last year. So we see this kind of really interesting, you know, even at the same time, the Democrats are being like, we're not with the Republicans, but they were also like, it really, it did become, I think, a coalition at the end where it was like, they were all driving the same messaging, the same talking points with maybe the small distinction that the moderate Democrats were saying like, we support criminal justice reform. We believe in giving people second chances. We believe in all of that, but we don't think that um, that Chesa is prioritizing public safety and victims, right? And so you really see that narrative taking hold, um, where then it allowed you know people like Brooke Jenkins, um, who is now the current district attorney, who was appointed by the mayor when Chesa uh, was recalled. So Brooke Jenkins often claims, you know, she is a big supporter of criminal justice reform. She believes in police accountability. Um, she believes in second chances for people. And, um, you know, one of our attendees just mentioned that, you know, there was a, uh, some violent incidences at Stonestown Mall recently in San Francisco. And, you know, the, the DA working with the mayor just put out a press release saying, we young people need support. They need after school programs. They need to be held accountable. We have these restorative justice program at the DA's office called Make It Right. That program is all about supporting young people to get access to second chances and to repair the harm they've caused. That program had, they have not gotten a single new restorative justice referral since last September, I believe it is. So essentially they have stopped restorative justice in the DA's office while they're saying that they are doing it all. So I think there's just so much hypocrisy right now about what they say in the narrative and then what's actually happening, right? And so that was really a key part of the recall was that kind of narrative tactic. Um, and so then you have who was funding it, right? So you have venture capitalists like David Sachs and Gary Tan, who were, you know, kind of some of them, I think David Sachs particularly was like a supporter of like open carry gun laws and, you know, just much more definitely on the right. Um, a lot of other tech donors, kind of like people who you know wrote op-eds and medium saying like, this city is a lawless place, I, we've gotten broken into. And I think that um, that really married with the kind of moderate democratic campaign and funded it very well. Um, I think at the end of the day, the recall, the pro recall forces outspent the anti-recall, like think three to one. Um, and they had, they didn't have a ton of access to money from tech, um, tech venture capitalists, tech donors, and um, as well as, I, I'm not sure, and yeah, and I can't actually remember now if the realtors threw in any money, but anyway. 
yeah developers I I mean it was a very convenient way to blame everything that had happened in the pandemic on one single person too I think that was also part of it um so you have tech um the SFPOA the police union was also obviously a huge um proponent of recalling Chesa. I think they knew that their popularity in San Francisco not, wasn't necessarily at the peak at that moment. So they didn't um, they didn't actually donate funds to the recall effort, but they were working hand in hand with the recall effort, essentially doing like a, an official work stoppage, right? And telling victims of crimes, there's no point in you even reporting this crime because Chase is not going to prosecute it, right? Just like very bald-faced lies about the way that, you know, um, they were working or not working with the DA. Um, and then you have like a lot of local elected officials. Uh, Mayor London Breed never officially came out in support of the recall, but behind the scenes, you know, these are definitely her people and, um, you know, yeah, she was supportive of it behind the scenes while not officially. Mm -hmm. um, and the more moderate um, conservative parts of the board of supervisors on the bottom. I think at the end of the day, only two supervisors came out supporting the recall. One was Catherine Stephanie and the other one who represents kind of like the richest, wealthiest areas of San Francisco. Um, and then uh, Matt Dorsey, who was appointed by London Breed. Uh, yeah, last year. So anyways, I don't think he came out in support of the recall. A lot of... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think there's a difference between people who were like saying, I, I'm going to be listed on the website, and then people who would just talk a lot of BS and talk, you know, basically fuel the flames of this narrative that like it's crime is out of control, things are bad in San Francisco, who's responsible? There's only one person, you know? Um, so, anyways, I'll, let me move on to the other side of this. Um, recall landscape. So then you have on the kind of opposing against the recall. This is not everybody, obviously. These are some of the folks who were part of um, funding the anti-recall campaign or had thrown down in specific ways to say, we are going to like go out there and um, oppose it and organize people. So you had the San Francisco Labor Council actually oppose the recall, um, which is a big deal, right? Because um, not San Francisco labor isn't always united on issues that are about progressives versus moderates. And so it was a big deal that they took that position. Um, some of the most active unions, um, uh, Service Employees International Union, you know, unions representing uh, nurses, janitors, security officers, um, home care workers, um, public sector employees. Uh, and then the ACLU of Northern California actually took a very a typical stance for them. They don't usually weigh in on elections for candidates at all. Um, and in this instance, I think a lot of people nationally were saying like, this is a big deal that one of the most progressive DAs and like basically like the second or third progressive DA elected as part of this reform minded DA movement was being recalled, right? And so the ACLU took a position against and came out very strongly against it um, from a criminal justice standpoint. Smart Justice California, which is based here and does a lot of like lobbying to legislators. Um, as a friendly action fund, which is our C4 organization also took a position and ran um, a lot of the field work in terms like door knocking people, phone banking voters. Um, and then you have some of these, some of our um, elect local elected officials, some who actually actively came out and supported Chase and others who were kind of like, I don't want to take a position because my constituents in my district are pounding on my door saying, what are you going to do about car break-ins? What are you going to do about this? You know, So it was a very contentious issue. And I, I would just want to say it wasn't easy for politicians to stand with Chesa because he was extremely unpopular. And as you can see, because he got recalled, um, though, of course, that was a low turnout election. But it was true that um, politically, a lot of people, even if they didn't agree with the recall, they would say, I'm not in support of recalls in general. I don't support recalls, but they would never like come out and campaign with him or st you know stump with him because it would have also been a little bit of a political in their minds probably political suicide. So, anyways, I'll just um, stop there and probably at, am I at time? Has it been ten minutes? Yeah, probably. yeah. Okay, let me just stop. Mm -hmm. Wait, before before we move on, let me just say I didn't say about the overall format. Um, they're going to do their overviews and I have a few questions, and then we will we will have time for a Q and A from all of you as well. Um, I'm also wondering if there's any way we can push it in a little bit more because we have some people in the hallway. Um, 
if you all want to try and make it in. It'll be standing or on the floor, but we still love to have you. Wow. Look at this mask. <laughs> Unison, <unity>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It looks like there's a seat. There's a seat here. Yeah. There's two seats uh, here. Two seats to the back. <laughs> One more seat if someone wants it back there. Okay. Joy, it's over to you. Cool. All right. I'm going to tie myself. Hi everyone, uh, Joyce again, uh, and uh, I want to share a little bit of context, you know, and background of myself and how I come into this work because I think that also informs me a lot, you know, in the organizing and analysis of what's happening in my community right now, right? So I'm an immigrant. Uh, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, and um, I, uh, you know, been at the Chinese Progressive Association for a little bit over ten years. Started out as an organizer, and really, you know, I think. Seeing the past 10 years, I think uh, sheds a lot of insight, you know, of like where we're at right now in our community, right, in the immigrant community. So I want to share a couple of points first of like the context, right? So what are people going through? You know, why are they where they're at? And why are they being pulled, you know, by different forces, different narratives? The first thing is that I think there is a change demographic, right, of immigrants, of Chinese immigrants, you know, uh, in the past decade, a little bit plus, more or less. And when I say that, I meant, you know, with family reunification, I feel like the past, you know, 20, 30 years, more folks, you know, are here to unify with their family, right? So there are more working class folks, you know, there are folks from like the Cantonese speaking regions of China, Southern China. And then in the past 10 years, you know, I think we're seeing, right, more uh, people with capital, you know, we're seeing uh, international students, you know, staying behind working in Silicon Valley. And because of their class background, right, the difference is that there's less of a need really for them to connect to resources, organizations on the ground, right? There's less of a need for them to navigate what does it mean to live in this country? They can buy a house, build a gate, you know, and just figure it out, right? Because they have the resource and they have the network. So that is one difference that I think kind of contributes to like how people are being funneled, you know, into different uh you know, affinity groups or like how they identify themselves even, right, in this country as a person of color. So they have a very superficial understanding, right, of like, I'm a person of color, you know, I'm a minority, but I can figure it out, right? I can pull up my bootstraps, I can find some way to pay some politician, right, to carry out my agenda, right? And I'm different, right, from poor people. So I think there is some distinct, you know, differences in a larger, you know, community that we're, we're talking about here, right? So, and there's a vacuum, right, for moderate forces to go in with, like, that American dream agenda and narrative of, like, here's what you need to do to make it, you know, in this country. And then the second thing, you know, that is happening uh, that I think we all deeply felt is that the deep inequality, right, and everyday struggles really is, like, pitting working class people of color against each other, right? So, when we talk about, okay, that subset of like middle, you know, upper class people of color is one group, but the people that we're trying to organize, that we're trying to build a base with, they are facing such deep struggles in their life that they don't have time, energy, and space to even process any of this, right? Our people are not, you know, making enough money to pay rent. Our people are just struggling to put food on the table and they're surviving a freaking pandemic. And so, at best, they're rece receiving like one-sided information, right? And at worst, they're just listening to these lies, right? That are that is like pulling them away and away from the organizations that we've spent decades, you know, building on the ground, right? Um, and that's a very real material condition, right? That we have to think about. Um, and that also, I think, creates a vacuum for them to just identify, you know, based on how people look, you know, versus like the real issues they're facing, right? So they are taking position more aligned with this like ethnic, you know, nationalism, you know, of like, I'm just going to stand with other Chinese people because that's like the easiest thing to figure out, right? Instead of like figuring out, actually, I have more shared interests, you know, with my Black neighbor, you know, than with the person who's living on the top of a hill, you know, in his own mansion, right? Um, and then, you know, I think that kind of like this overall narrative, right, that is pushed actually by some of the moderate Democrats that Emily was talking about, of like, 
I am a Democrat for, you know, lifetime Democrat in San Francisco, but I think the city is out of control, right? This is the broad narrative. You all have seen, you know, the op-eds on New York Times, you know, these national outlets. We're not even, you know, just being laughed at by Fox News. We're being laughed at by everybody in this country, right? And so I think that narrative, you know, works really well and it matches up with people's lived experience of like the car break-ins, the dirty streets, you know, and they see a lot of homeless folks, you know, on the street. And so everything makes sense in their head, right? And that is kind of like the, the big picture that people are living in. And then the last thing in terms of context that I will lift up to is everybody in this room has probably heard about WeChat, maybe more or less as like the, the engine, you know, it fuels, you know, this like Chinese right wing, you know, surge, right? Yes, I think there is some truth to it because it is a very like multi-purpose platform. So it's not just like a Twitter where it's like one-sided, I'm pushing something out. It's a chat room where people are actively like communicating to each other and organizing. And the most important point is that it is something that people, you know, communicate, you know, with loved ones from home, right? Like that's a big thing for the immigrant community. That is like the state sanctioned and very much controlled, you know, platform for people in China. And so it is kind of like this all in one monster, you know, a little bit of like creating like this info and like inflammatory things. But, you know, it is not just that, right? Like I want to, and I work a lot, you know, on WeChat. I have to work a lot on WeChat, but I also want to take away a little bit so that people understand it's just one part of it, right? It still comes back to the organizing and the resources that's funding that organizing that is not just about the app itself, right? So anyway, um, so who who is the opposition, right? What are they trying to do? Um, I think, you know, the agenda really started out as like very basic traditional American dream type of stuff, right? Good schools, safe streets, accountable government, right? Everybody wants that. Who doesn't want that in this room? Come on, everybody in this living planet wants that, right? But it's being kind of like feed into this, like, well, this is not happening because you have a progressive government, you have progressive board of supervisors, blah, 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 right? And um, there's also in this narrative, like a complete like color blindness, right? It ignores, right, the racial context. It ignores like how Chinese Americans fit into, you know, that paradigm in, in this country, right? Um, and we are seeing more stroking of like ethnic nationalism, right? There's more co-opting of like language from our movement, right? Whenever it's something, it's like, not centering just Chinese people or putting Chinese people's interest at first, you know, it is being called as racist or Chinese exclusion, right? We see it in, for example, locally in San Francisco, the redistrict redistricting fight last year, right? Of people coming in and saying, this is about including Chinese people. You have to like, you know, listen to our agenda and just like do what we tell you to do because that's the that's the, you know, Chinese, you know, um, or supporting Chinese people, right? Okay. Um, so some of the key issues, you know, includes, right, uh, I think in the education arena, undoing affirmative action, right, mm -hmm. of saying that merit-based, you know, and this is like locally happening, you know, with the Lowell fight, you know, some of you might have heard of it, but across the country, we're seeing all the school boards, you know, um, all the, you know, SFUSD are being like taken over, you know, and Chinese folks, Chinese parents are being used as a wedge, right, in those, in those fights. Um, there is, um, you know, fighting against like data disaggregation, right? The same thing, you know, don't try to divide us, you know, like we are people of color, right? But really taking away the nuances, you know, and the resources that each of our community needs and deserve. Um, and then supporting and upholding traditional, like, um, you know, uh, punishment, you know, law and order, right? Policies uh, in the name of public safety. And, um, you know, and I think I really want to lift up, you know, that, in San Francisco, 60% of Asian Americans own their own homes. And that's even higher, right, than the white population. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we take that apart, we see that Southeast Asians, we see that, you know, Pacific Islanders numbers were more at like 30, 40%. And you have to think about the fact that a third of Chinatown lives in poverty. And that's like the poorest neighborhood in the city. So our community, it's so, you know, like the, the inequality, it's so big, right? And there's so many nuances and layers that I think oftentimes what I find, you know, as a movement worker is that people look at us as one block, you know, 
previously were like taken for granted, you know, now we're like on the right wing. I'm going to give up on you. Right. And that's not, that's not, that's not who we are. That is not who we are. Right. So the last thing that I will share in terms of like the work that we're doing is that one, I think really going back to the listening and the organizing, like we have to go back the bread and butter that we're the best at and use that to build a base that will listen to us when crisis happens, right? It's like when shit happened, are they going to look on WeChat or are they going to call me to get more accurate information? And that comes from relationships, that comes from organizing and winning material things through campaign work, right? Um, and then we have to innovate, you know, we have to think about how are we building relationship with other communities of color? That means, you know, doing members like devoting staff time, you know, and devoting like actual intention and capacity to do exchanges, like basic stuff, break bread together, right? Talk about political stuff together. Let's have a chance to meet each other and not just like see each other's faces on the news as victims and perpetrators, because that's what's hurting us, right? Like we need to create just social space sometimes even, just hang out, you know, listen to music, talk about our kids, right? Um, and then I think the last thing is like communication strategy, right? We need to do it faster, right? The one-on-one -on -one is gonna take a long time. The relationship is worth it, but it is gonna take a long time. So how do we combine it with strategic communication strategy? Build the bench, you know, we need more spokespeople. It can't just be one person. I'm gonna stop right there, Anne. I know we'll have more conversation later. Oh, actually, if I can share. So this is um, on the left. Uh, this is like one example of disinformation on WeChat. So before the 2020 fall Trump election um, or, or the, that presidential election, we're seeing on WeChat, you know, people are saying that do not go outside. You know, there'll be a riot if Trump didn't get elected or if Trump either way, there'll be a riot. So stay home, you know, so clear like voter suppression stuff. So we had to jump in. So we partnered CPA, we partnered with APEN and we just created some quick image and say, this is false. You know, this is voter suppression. You should go vote, you'll be okay. Um, second slide. So sorry, this, the next few slides are gonna be a little bit triggering, but this is some kind of the kind of rhetoric, you know, that people are using, right? Inflammatory languages. So on the left is an image uh, and disinformation, right? The POA's tweet uh, to attack Chesa. And it talks about how, oh, Chesa is releasing the perpetrators, you know, that killed this young person. And that is false, you know? And I actually had to engage in a WeChat fight with someone and be like, let me show you. I'll show you the receipts, you know? They're in jail. Um, and then on the right is like Leanna Louie, you know, uh, Emily mentioned her, but very personal, you know, attacks about people's like family background. So this is the kind of thing that they were doing on WeChat, right? And then last slide, apologies again for the trigger. Oh, oh not this one, actually. Um, can you go one more? Yeah. So this is Ellen Lee Zhao. Uh, she ran for mayor twice, I think 2019, uh, 2018, 2019. Yeah. But um, yeah, so she is like a big Trump supporter. And for a long, you know, after Mayor Ed Lee passed away, you know, she's like the only other Chinese person who's running for mayor. And even though we're like, she's like a little bit like really off, you know, and like she's like, you know, guns, you know, and like anti-Black, you know, a lot of these like things that you would imagine that like most people would be like, no way. But, you know, she did have like a little bit of a base because she is responding, you know, to people's very real needs and concerns about crime and schools and things like that. So she was at the January 6th insurrection. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. She was there. Oh, yeah. Sure. But then she was very proud and she was like, you know, posting pictures. And then and then she was like, oh, no, I was just, you know, I was just passing by. Yeah. <laughs> just passing by. Yeah. That's it for me. I think that's what they're trying to imply. Yeah. 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 So. Thank you. Um, is Amy's mic working? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. I wish I actually had a picture of like the political landscape um, that Emily started off with. I think that was just like kind of tying um, like all of these issues together. Um, I mean, I was very much engaged with uh, the recall election of Chesa, um, you know, like worked hard and was like so proud, you know, like and excited that he was elected. And then to also have 
that recall happened at the same time as the Board of Ed recalls that um, are not directly connected to what I'm going to be talking about, but there are connections because like these attacks on progressive education and criminal reform is is and criminal justice reform is like very much connected and there's um, there's connections with the voter blocks too on like who came out and who voted and how education and criminal justice are framed. And so I, I, I just, I very much appreciate that. And to think about um, how, how worried I am like within San Francisco as now um, I'm back in the classroom teaching and just how um, moderate the direction of um, what we really started um, within San Francisco Unified as a progressive ethnic studies, like how that is at, um, is, um, is going to be, I know, this thing. It always goes at the right time. How that's, thank you. Like, how I'm worried for that. I am. I'm fearful for how moderate the um, the direction of our educational system can go. So um, I'm also going to give you a kind of overall context of ethnic studies within California. So I'm kind of going to start there. Um, so you can go to the next. So how many of you all have, um, how many of you all are a teacher? Or have been a teacher in public schools. Yay. Yeah, you can give them hands. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. How many of you all have had children that have gone to public schools in the Bay Area? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. How many of you all have gone to public schools in California? Okay. I did not count, but almost all of us have had some relationship with public schools in California. So therefore, you are all experts in education and educational policy and how we should should operate our schools, right? You do have a say and a stake though in the direction of our schools, right? Um, so ethnic studies, um, there's been, first of all, there's a, a deep tradition in ethnic studies in the Bay Area. And I want to acknowledge that first because those of us who do the work stand on the shoulders of people who have come before us and people that are going to continue to come after us in the struggle. So um, starting off from where we are in, at, in Berkeley, right? And then um, uh, my connection, I live in San Francisco. So with the um, 1968 strikers in at San Francisco State and the deep traditions that, and Mr. Walter Riley, yeah. Um, and the connections that high schools K K twelve have had, right? And so you continue on to Berkeley High School, um, Oakland Unified are in, in a really beautiful, deep um, um, progress and 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 redo of their ethnic studies and, um, that is going, or excuse me, um, history social science that is going to be rooted in ethnic studies. Um, New Haven Unified School District, who has their own department of ethnic studies and San Francisco um, Unified, which again is where I come from, where we have been um, working on our curriculum um, since 2008. So you can go to the next. And so this is a picture of, of us after we successfully had a unanimous, unanimous decision um, in the board to extend the opportunity for every high school to every high school student to at least have an option to take an ethnic studies class. So this was in 2014. So this was when we were able to pilot ethnic studies in all um, high schools, secondary high schools, and that's both alternative and comprehensive schools. You can go on to the next. Um, and then that goes up to, um, that goes a little bit further out to give you some context of what is actually happening based off of um, statewide movement. So those of us in SFUSD and in other um, local districts who, who were in the fight for ethnic studies, um, we're a lot of us are classroom teachers, right? So we're working on what do we do on the day to day? How do we move um, within our local um, organizing structures to actually allow for a more liberatory, progressive ethnic studies program for our students? 
And then you get a movement where why can't we have that kind of access for all students? Okay, so um, there are some of us, myself included, that um, we're not necessarily um, excited about state co-opting of curriculum, especially at ethnic studies levels, because you come up against issues of what happens when you actually create uniformity um, with something that is supposed to be so rooted in the community and be responsive to the communities in which you're serving. Um, but in uh, 2060, AB um, 2016 um, was signed in the legislation to create a model curriculum. So it was not legislation to, um, to create an ethnic studies class yet. This was just to create um, examples for teachers who and school di districts who would want to actually roll out an ethnic studies program, either if that's um, kind of a survey class or if it's um, um, specific disciplinary um, subgroup classes, right? So like an Africana studies class, Latinx studies class, so on and so forth. Um, and so there was an advisory committee um, that was compiled of people, um, experts in the field, um, at all different levels, university professors, um, K-12 educators. Um, I was also on that, um, that committee. And so we were gathered and um, went through a pretty rigorous process that's like very um, uniform in any curriculum that the state is developing. You have to go through like a revision process and so on and so forth. It all has to be public. Um, and we created a draft that included a unit on Arab American studies. And we followed the, um, the movement that San Francisco State has actually done to create an Arab American, um, uh, Arab American studies within um, their, um, their College of Ethnic Studies. And so when we included that, we also included a lesson plan and focused on Palestinian and looked at, um, the movements between Black Lives Matter and BDS as being possible forms of um, studying solidarity movements and specifically focusing on um, the colonial state of Israel. Didn't know if it would stay, <laughs> kind of assumed it wasn't going to stay, but we put it in there. So that really became the center of the critique around the state. So it became the focus of, um, of right-wing conservative Jewish organizations that attacked that particular piece as being anti-Semitic. And then we also, um, we also gained other critiques, um, particularly um, about capitalism as being an exploitative, oppressive, um, economic system, amongst other things. And so the original committee, myself included, um, after the revision process happened, it was watered down so much that we took our names off and we were dismissed after allegations of being anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli, anti-Zionist, and so on and so forth. Um, and so this effort by the state to co-opt the curriculum really became um, the center of what now has become our fight is ethnic studies for who? Ethnic studies for what purpose? And so who gets to define ethnic studies became the original struggle that we had to push back upon. And then you can go to the next. Um, but really what that did especially during the historical time of COVID, changed this organizing strategy from local schools, teachers, community members pushing um, within your, um, your districts, right? Parents, families, different folks that have, like you all, have an investment in public education, right? And so, it allowed for us to actually move uh, much more broadly 
and allowed for us to have a much more um, uniform approach to what was happening um, across the state. So um, we had, um, like you see up here, we had a, a, a beautiful mass grassroots support effort that, um, that spanned the state. We were able to start organizing, those, those of us who are here in the Bay Area were able to start organizing with people down in Southern California. Um, we we're able to organize with people in other states that are dealing with similar issues, even if they might not call their courses ethnic studies. We're able to, to organize with folks in Boston and in Vermont and in New York and in Chicago um, that are dealing with similar issues and similar pushback. Um, and this movement, and I really also appreciate like uh, what Joyce brought up, like these moderate forces, right? Like that there is this, this vacuum, you know, like to push, I think, a, a lot of people towards this American dream ideology, you know? And so the, you can go on to the next. Um, and it's these, again, in California and in San Francisco, this movement to allow for ethnic studies and progressive education for everyone, you know, and we really believe like that everyone should have, have access to that. Um, but now we have a state mandate where every student will have within um, the graduating class of 2009, at least a semester of ethnic studies. And that really comes down to then, how is this course going to be taught? Are we going to maintain the principles and values of the Third World Liberation Front? Like, are we going to maintain those that Walter and 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 your and the 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 legends that we have who made like we have we owe you, you know? Is that going to be maintained across the state? And so this is where we 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 end at, you know, like what is it going to be? Who is it going to be for? And what is going to be the purpose? All right. Um, thank you all for those overviews. I think you all already touched on this next question a little bit, but if you want to draw out more, um, any of the contradictions or tensions or political questions that you're grappling with in the next page of the site. Um, and now could also be a time if you heard anything from, you know, clearly we already hear some overlap. There's the geographic and like some of the specific players, but if there's other connections you're seeing either between the tensions or just overall the different um, campaigns and sites you three are working on, we'd love to draw that out now too. Anyone can start. Um, maybe I'll just start by listing some of what I think are more obvious contradictions that I feel like the left struggles with on anything related to electoral politics, right? I think that there's a lot of tension um, around electoral organizing as a strategy and building political power as a strategy. And so it's something that I think I struggle with in terms of like doing, I've been doing electoral organizing for 15 years now. And so it's very deeply part of my belief of like, how do we build and win power and actually prepare to govern Right. If the idea is that we actually do actually want to be able to propose alternatives and not just oppose and critique what is the status quo, how do we prepare ourselves to govern? And to me, part of that is it's not even just winning elections. Honestly, winning elections, actually, I think we know how to do and to some extent, at least in San Francisco. Um, the, the issue is when you actually get into power, that's actually the hardest part. It's like when you get into power, then a lot of contradictions and that all emerged, I think, with Chesa. You know, he was probably the first politician who's won a citywide office. A pro sorry, first progressive who won a citywide office in San Francisco since. Uh, well, I, I was yeah. I was like, I don't know. It's been many, many decades. It's been a long time, right? Like, actually, it's very difficult. And so when he won, I think there is. I mean, obviously, a lot of progressives came out and supported him. And I think there was, you know, many people who identify as abolitionists in like the broader world, because his race actually was seen as a national race, right? There was national attention on it. And so I think many abolitionists were like, there's no such thing as a progressive prosecutor. That's not 
possible. There's no, <laughs> there's no, uh, there's no way you should co-govern with a, a DA. Like their job is to incarcerate and charge people with crimes, right? Like, and so I think that that contradiction was very deep in this, particularly for that race, race for DA. Um, and obviously for myself coming from an electoral organizing power building perspective, it's something that we've grappled with for many years as we've elected people to like the board of supervisors and into city hall or other elected offices. Um, it's different. Obviously the DA has a lot more money and a lot more power than a single city supervisor, right? Um, but I do think that's one of the things that is like a question for all of us is this question of, so are we saying then we shouldn't contest for better candidates or we shouldn't contest for, you know, yeah, a lot of institutions do harm to communities, right? And so is that, was electing Chesa, you know, so I, I kind of land on one side of the, you know, that, that question of like, yes, it's important for us to struggle for power and for fight for more terrain. Um, I think in this instance, that struggle led to us actually re like moving many steps backwards um, because the backlash has been so intense with like the pandemic um, and the way that these dynamics have played out. I do think that it provided kind of the first time though that progressives had real direct line to the DA. Like that was the first time you could actually call up the DA and be like, hey, like people are gonna do a civil disobedience or an action, we're gonna take over city hall and they're gonna get arrested. Will you commit to not charge the people, the organizers who are doing this? You know, or actually, will you meet with the families of victims of police violence who've been killed and shot by the police? They wanna talk to you actually, right? And so I do think it's like, we're not used to that. We're not used to having that access, to have that relationship. Um, so I think that is a real point of tension in electoral organizing and in this DA race in particular. Um, so, you know, Chesa had his, you know, a lot of critics from the left and the right, you know, and all across the whole political spectrum. Um, and I do think that, yeah, that's just a, it's a hard question. I think, yeah, I don't necessarily have a convincing argument, I think, for a lot of people on this. It's just that, Part of it is this belief that like we can't do better until we try, until we figure out what the role is and how we govern. And you know, there's people who went into office with him who were lifelong public defenders who would consider themselves abolitionists and who came out of that role saying, I don't know if I could ever go back to working for the public defender because we were fighting for crumbs. Mm. And like being in office in the DA was kind of like, I did more in that role than I was did in 30 years of my career as a public defender. And so I think it is this, interesting piece about how we relate to having power, you know? Um, so I think that is like the piece that's like really hard because we're so used to not having power. And we're in this kind of reactive moment where we don't have power again. And it's a very hard moment to be not just reacting all the time. And that's why mm -hmm. to Barbara Ramsey's point about why is it so important that we engage with the United Front and build that power and then also be building the left movement so we have clear strategy about what we're doing when we have power. So anyways, I think it's both and, but it is like a hard question I feel like many people grappled with. Sorry, that was too long. Great. <laughs> um, I think there's two points. I mean, again, I think I I said this around the state mandate. Like whenever you, you, you do see a win and you are accepted into this mainstream state base, you know, like, or a, a position of power, like, and you're trying to challenge power, <laughs> there are going to be forces that are going to push you more towards the status quo. And so I think that there, there are just so many connections with that and um, with the state mandate that we're dealing with, because it is the contradiction that we're dealing with. Like, how do you get, how do you, how do you with ethnic studies, like a, um, a discipline that is, is demanding that systems change and demand that we, we envision a different world for tomorrow? Like, how can you not challenge that? And so on one hand, we can say the more pushback that we get, like the better that we're doing, you know, but on the other hand, then I always, I always think about like folks doing ethnic studies with a uh, graduation requirement up like in um, Placerville, you know, because I have friends that live in Placerville and it's like, it's not, it's like, who's going to teach it? How are they going to teach it? How are they going to be community responsive too? you know, like what is, 
um, the framework, right? Because this was another issue that we were dealing with um, in the middle of um, the direct um, uh, backlash is that ethnic studies is not just content to be covered. It is a way of seeing the world and being in the world and analyzing the world in a different way, right? And so it's giving students a lens and tools to analyze and see a better future for themselves, right? And so you can you can have that same lens developed in a very um, a very beautiful way in a county like Placerville, where there are like very few students of color, right? Um, but again, it's like how are you going to do that and for what purpose um, and towards what ends? And then the other um, the other piece is that, you know, like, yeah, I think just that's that's it for this moment. Yeah. Um, I think I'm like really sitting with, um, you know, Amy, you just talked about kind of like how building the United Front, you know, was like really crucial, right? And in, in this work. And and then the morning plenary about like, yeah, the United Front. It has to be principled, it has to be big enough, but not big enough that anyone can walk in, right? And I think one of the tension that, you know, those of us who organize in, in the Chinese immigrant community often face is that how do we like speed up, you know, and bring people into, you know, all these different fronts, you know, but then also meet people where they're at, right? Because I'm gonna be honest with you, you know, it's hard to talk about cannabis you know, in our community, right? It's hard to talk about even gender issues, right, in our community. Uh, it's easier to talk about worker issues, you know, that is like a little bit easier for folks to grasp. But I think a challenge, you know, or a tension that we often have, it's like, for example, bringing back to the school district fights, right? In the past couple of years, we've seen many worthwhile, worthwhile and important fights, you know, murals in Washington High School, right? Things like that, that for our folks, there's like no way in, you know, the tent was not built for them to understand why it's all even on the agenda when all they care about is like, when are we going to reopen the schools? Because I need to get back to work, right? How are we going to improve, you know, the math standards, you know, because we're doing terribly, right? We see our kids are doing terribly. So, you know, and, and the Chinese immigrant community is not the only community that's feeling this way about the left in general, right? It's like, why are you talking about all these like ideological stuff? You know, I don't get it. You know, I just want going back to like good schools, safe streets, accountable government, right? These are the things that I want and I need. And so I think attention, you know, for us, you know, as, you know, folks who identified as progressives, but also working directly with the base is how do we bring those things back to the base so they can digest it, understand it, but also show them that we're in it for their issues, right? It's like, how do we balance both things? Because we know we have a finite amount of time, you know, but yeah, how do we bring more people in? I think it's like, a big tension. And I think in the Morling Pannery, you know, we talked about how we need to create that journey for people to join us. There are millions of like Asian Americans who are agitated by this moment as we're being called, framed, named as victims, right? In this moment, anti-Asian hate, right? Everybody's like, I wanna do something for my community. And these are really good energy, right? But again, they're being sucked up, right? Cause there's a vacuum, they're being sucked up by like folks who are more moderate, you know, or reactionary in thinking about short-term solutions. And so how are we creating that journey together, you know, as a, as a left, right? Just some small questions. <laughs> um, amazing. I think I'm gonna actually save my last question about what's next for the very end. So we can close with that and, that, and now open it up um, for a few questions from all of you. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, it's not, the mic isn't gonna help amplify sound. It's just for the recording. So if anyone, when you're asking your question, can still speak up, that would be great. I was gonna get this. Great. <laughs> <laughs> 
actually, um, <clears throat> I don't really have a question. I actually just have more comments. Excuse me. Um, I was in San Francisco at the, the, the Board of Education's um, um, meeting to, to talk about and address the covering up of the Washington mural. I was there as an indigenous person to support the, Indi the indigenous community who wanted to see this covered up. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about um, when we were talking about ethnic studies in our high schools is that I've been involved in a lot of work of removing Indian mascots from public schools. So as far as ethnic studies is concerned, um, how, how are you going to teach our history at the same time when we're being, you know, we're being dehumanized for sports entertainment? And so I've talked about this to ethnic people who are talking about ethnic studies is that, you know, you're going forward with all of these programs, but we need to get rid of the rest of these Indian mascots here in California. You know, I've been McClyman's High School, that was student led. They they did they got rid of all of their Indian imagery. The last one I was involved in was in Concord, Ignacio Valley High School. They got rid of the name of Warriors and all the imagery. And in return for all of that, are they going to start really teaching our history? And one of the things that ends up being really, really bad with with this that this state is that they don't even teach California Indian history. They're not teaching what the genocide that happened to us right here, right here in the California missions. There are two of them, three of them within this area. None of that gets taught. And so this is what is really troubling for me. You know, when doing this work, I've also done the Vallejo Apaches, the Napa Indians, I've been all over. The, you know who you know who who we get the backlash from? It's not the students. It's the it's people who've been out of high school for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It's all these old ass fucking people who've been out of high school and they're like, well, it's our tradition. No, it's not your tradition. It's the tradition of racism. You want to honor us, honor, honor our goddamn treaties. You know, you know. How can you even compare what we went through? We were fighting for our very existence. You're playing football. There's no genocide in football, okay? So this is one of the things that I've been trying to push with all of this ethnic studies is that you can't teach about our history and then go on the football field and, and, and trivialize our culture, our ancestors, our history. Um, I um, have been engaged over in the East Bay and in San Francisco too around some of these issues, but all of the, um, the um, subject areas that have been discussed here, we're dealing with right now in Oakland. And it would be nice to discuss, see how some of that is working out. Uh, around education, I've been working with folks and there's a movement that's been trying to in the shutdown the austerity program, uh, which is a lie, the lie that we don't have enough money in the schools. Those kinds of things are very uh, relevant right now to the struggles today. There was political activity all week and the coming week. So I'd like people here to be aware of some of those things that, that's going on. Uh, one of the powerful groups that has so much to say about education in California is FICMA, which people don't know about which is a private group that the governor appoints. Uh, we don't even hear about how much power we have to deal with that. Uh, there's that attempt to expose that, to stop the closure. In Oakland, we have been able to develop progressive movement and elected the folks who identified as progressives. Uh, we have been part of the electing a progressive group to city council and a mayor who is within the progressive ambit. And the discussions around ethnic identities, racism, all the things that are being mobilized in San Francisco is being mobilized here. 
the movement of people who came to this meeting are not visible in the struggles in Oakland. And uh, there are some of the organizations, but we need to understand that uh, when we discuss radical politics or progressive politics, it shouldn't be the past. It has to be what's happening right now. And that's true in, in San Francisco. We elected a uh, progressive uh, uh, prosecutor. Um, I was involved in transition. I want to see more people here involved in that discussion and how we move forward. We need people here involved with mobilizing in our various communities uh, around stopping the recall and developing a progressive agenda. We need people dealing with the black agenda uh, that understands the reactionary re re res responses that are coming from certain sectors of the community, uh, how we develop and, 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 and the activists in San Francisco could help develop and deepen the ties. Uh, I was uh, at, a, at, a, at a rally in the meeting of the Asian community in support of the mayor. Uh, we need more young folk there who are radicals and activists in that community. Uh, at that meeting, all of the people were all younger than me because I'm 78, but it was not the young radical activists because one of the problems I think the plenary talked about is that um, we need to deepen our ties and not just talk to each other. Uh, many of us here are talking to each other and our NGOs are, are, and we call ourselves community organizers because we run an NGO, but that is not a community organizer. Community organizers have a longer and more deeper tradition in reaching out. Uh, how we do that, I mean, working families and all these other groups that are around. I'm just saying, Something happened that right here where we're sitting, Berkeley and, and Oakland and, and, and San Leandro, we are engaged in these struggles and we're not in this conversation. So radicals and activists and, and, and those of us with a lot of energy, young folk, uh, and these progressive movements uh, can help to step up these struggles right here in the East Bay around all of these issues of education, of, of, of building solidarity with each other and fighting back and building progressive agendas. And um, more of that needs to be seen and more of the, more of the language that you have for reaching young folk and, and again, talking to different people and seeing how we can do some of that. There are groups that are coming together uh, that is not necessarily the NGOs that all of us work with. Uh, and, and let's find them, let's find each other. Just adding or building on what um, Mr. Riley just said, I would love to hear Joyce and maybe the other speakers uh, talk about the practicalities of fighting a recall, because I think the probability of that occurring in Alameda County are fairly high. Pamela Price has, um, maybe two, has a lot to offer, and her skill set is not always the most conciliatory or whatever. How can we support a progressive DA? Uh, yeah, why don't we stack two? Yeah, Azil, do you want to do yours too? Yeah, we're going to, yeah, yeah, we're stacking. <laughs> so we're doing a different strategy for the next few. We're just going to get a few questions and then they'll answer both. Yeah. No, good question. <laughs> I think with that being said, I'll just connect my question to that. So we always talk about what it is that we want to do, you know, stop the recall or recall whatsoever. It's always about the big moment. So I wonder, um, along with that question, what, uh, there's always that growing need for you no know, narrative, for engaging in narrative battles, for relational organizing, growing need for legislative advocacy. So I just wonder how do we build up? Like what are the things that we need to do? What are the, the resources? What are the relationships that we need to forge beforehand or as we do the work? We'll just take those two for now, so feel free to. 
Um, I'll just say real quick on the recall question. So I've been in several conversations actually with Alameda County folks who have been trying to support Pamela Price um, and kind of trying to learn from the mistakes, lessons learned of San Francisco. Um, you know, I just have to say, it's not true for everyone, but for a lot of politicians to run, you need to have a very large ego. And that le lends, it doesn't always lend itself to, you know, that kind of like, how they're gonna build their allies, because I think Chesa won through ranked choice voting, and it wasn't, it was a, it was a small, Margin. It was. A, it was not an overwhelming. Like, yes, we're with you, Chase. You know what I mean. And so, I think he came out right out of the gate, being like, "I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna drop. You know, we're gonna have no cash bail. We're gonna um, no young people will be charged. Like, like he went out with some policies that I think, you know, he technically didn't have term limits, right? Like, as a DA, you don't have term limits, so you can do your things in a much slower fashion, but. You know, he was he was eager to prove himself as like the champion that the left elected, um, and as like kind of progressives nationally. And so I think that he also didn't have his comms team set up right. Like he literally was unable to hire a comms a full comms team for well into his first term, and that was a huge um, hamstring or ham. He was hamstrung by that um, because it was always about a media war. It was always about the narrative and what story was. They were just, but that's the other thing too. Could we have stopped it? They were, the police were ready the day he was elected. They launched a website called Boudin Blunders, right? And they're encouraging people to type in their experiences with crime so they could follow up with them, right? So it's like, it was, and same thing with Pamela Price. Like, you should be ready for a recall because it's coming, right? They're already setting it up in the media and in the narrative if you read the, the articles, right? So I think that. There is a lot to learn. I think that, you know, I think she is trying to learn from Chase's mistakes. And it's like, this is the first time in 100 years there was a contested race for DA in San Francisco. Let's just not forget the historical nature of it. The first time it hasn't been just an incumbent who was appointed running. It was the first time there's an open seat. And so I do think it's kind of like, yes, we have to remember we did, it was like, but it's like we are, we're trying to fight to make progress to build a different terrain so that the next time we fight, we have better chances, right? And we're learning from it. Um, so I do think it's just like, it is historic in nature what we're able to do. And it's historic that he got recalled, the first progressive DA to get recalled. Um, and I think that they set a blueprint for Alameda County. And so I think it is really important. And the racial dynamics are also very important to understand in San Francisco. The top elected uh, and appointed uh, leaders in San Francisco are actually black. African American leaders, London Breed, she appointed Police Chief Scott, uh, Brooke Jenkins, uh, like, yeah, I mean, I think yeah. Shaman opposed the recall, actually. So I just, in terms of like, what the racial dynamic is in San Francisco, it's not the same in Alameda County. So I think that's also going to play out differently with a. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not the same. So I think it's like, it is important to understand your context, your you know, what is actually happening that's different. Um, and they are gonna try to use the same playbook, right? So I do think that narrative is a huge area that like our organizations are not equipped to, we're not ready enough to fight that. Um, like we need to have stories out like every week, you know, basically, and we're losing right now this narrative battle around the a definition of what safety is, right? Safety is more police and more incarceration right now. And if we're, if we're not able to turn that around, yes, our, our candidates, they're gonna be just, like they're constantly going to be in defense mode, right? So I do think it's important that um, we recognize that. And yeah, I think um, I don't know if I answered Dean's questions actually, but I'll just ask you. Um, I think it's like a little bit of both questions about like what do we need to do in this moment about the relational organizing. And so uh, in the past few years, actually, you know, our team as the DA, you know, well, actually, we've been doing this work for over a decade, which is like building up. Um, you know, engaging in like contesting for power electorally, you know, so building up a canvas team, you know, of a language, you know, canvas organizers, right? So we actually develop, recruited, developed, and hired like folks directly from the community. These are monolingual, you know, just workers, you know, who might or might not have a job, but then they will spend a couple of hours on the phone at the door, you know, after work or like after childcare duties to talk to people, talk to their neighbors, talk to their friends. I've been doing this for like over 10 years, you know. Um, and I think, you know, what we need to do is actually make it a regular thing. 
and not just do it while elections happen because that's always too late. You yep. know, as we all know, you know, anybody who's been to the door, they know they already know about Chesa by that point. They've already made up their mind about him. But, you know, for example, like, you know, uh, before the recall, we were able to run a couple of weeks, you know, of what we call deep canvas would really just mean a deep one-on-one -on -one with someone, you know, that you met for the first time at the door, right? To talk to them about safety. What are you really looking for? So I think resourcing more of these opportunities for people to invest time in the conversation and in the relationship so it doesn't just happen, you know, when a crisis broke out or like, yeah. Um, and then to, to piggyback off of that, because I think, again, like organizing within educational spaces, like is not just, I don't, I don't think it should just be driven by nonprofits or, 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 you know, it's like, obviously we all work together, but it's like we're, the last few years we've been operating so much on the defensive, you know, and like, again, um, being in connection with folks across the state, it's like, we've been engaged with um, teachers down in San Diego that have been like getting hit pretty hard in San Mateo, been, getting hit pretty hard with like these, um, these very conservative um, groups that are coming in to like speak out against the work that they're doing at school boards. And they're like from, they're not from the community. It's like their children do not go to the school. So how do we get more people into school board meetings? How do we get more investment with people um, that when things are not in crisis, you know, but like we can give feedback to what's happening and give support, you know, to folks that are down in San Diego because we're in communication with one another, you know, and like we're prepared to ha to, to support people when the time comes when um, those attacks happen. And um, like we, I was in the district in the central office with ethnic studies, history and social science. Um, this would have been my fourth year and I left because I, I'm very opposed to what the district is doing, not just around history, social science, and ethnic studies, but some other issues <laughs> that had come up um, that I'm not going to expand on here. But um, a big part of what I saw as my job, because I was trained by organizers, I'm, I'm a classroom teacher, you know, I don't necessarily say like I come from an organizing background, but I was trained by organizers, you know, and it's like, how do you make connections across and bring people together? was what I saw as part of my job. You know, like how do you bring the community in, get input and voices from other people, right? Um, and um, be in community, like we were in community with our Indian ed folks. And like, how do you bring them into the work so that they're leading, you know, the, what, what it is you're doing? And that brings us to other school districts in the East Bay and so on and so forth, you know? But like that mentality is not, um, in all school districts around ethnic studies. And I think it, it needs to be, you know, it's not just another class, um, but it has to be part of the, the job, I think, of folks that are in like the central office, like to actually have that mentality. If you're not an organizer, like looking towards other examples of how you bring the community in and get their input and their leadership on what the, the, the course actually needs to be. Thank you. Um, I think while we're on this topic of the future, I think would now would be a good time um, just for you all to share if there's anything else you want to add about what's next, what's next for um, this fight, this campaign, this issue area, um, both like the work that you are doing um, or your organizations are doing or your coalitions are doing and also like what you think is needed next. Okay. <laughs> all good. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, any of you, either of you. <laughs> yeah. Not Emily. Um, again, like the um, the work that we're doing across the state and within the the Bay Area is again like really trying to 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 look at like um, may helping be in community with districts across the state and locally um, to figure out how we are going to be in community together towards a liberatory ethnic studies that really does challenge the status quo and, system, and systems of oppression. Um, I would say that, I would say a top priority being for my community, it's like 
what is going to be our agenda. It's kind of like the offense defense, you know, it's like, I think it's enough, enough time has passed, you know, that we're just like, no, 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 that's not what we want. No, we need to fight, you know, these measures. But it's like, what is it that actually responds to people's needs? And what is it that, you know, going back to that big time question of like, what is like a principle that we can unite ourselves around at the same time moving people closer, you know, to the progressive movement, you know, that we have. And so, yeah, clear, concrete, material policies and campaigns, you know, that will rebuild, you know, that confidence that people have, you know, in us, that we're serious about their needs, we know what they need, and um, and that, you know, our future is actually a better future, right, mm -hmm. than from the other side, so. Um, I would say two next steps. One is kind of just to reiterate what the plenary speakers are talking about. If we are not invested in prioritizing and doubling down on mass organizing and base building and whatever organizations we're part of, we've already lost because we're not fighting for the, the popular consciousness. We're not fighting to bring people with us with our ideas. And so I think if we're not investing in that kind of deep-rooted organizing and we're not comfortable talking to people who don't necessarily agree with us, we've already lost. So I think it's just that idea of like investing in base building, one-on-one -on -one organizing, like to go back to basics. It's not about our social media strategy, actually. It's like or our toolkits that we make. It's actually about can we organize people like at scale, not just 10 people, 20, but like this conference, 500 people, that's amazing, who registered. But like, what about for the people who aren't where we are right now? Like, what's our path to bring them in? So they can be at this conference next year. Um, and I think, <laughs> and number two, I would say, um, we, as, a, as leftists, I think our job is to cohere the forces, like to unite the forces. So like the ones that I shot, showed on my slide, it wasn't a, obvious thing that, oh, that we're all going to throw down against the recall. We had to convince people. We had to kind of unite labor and parts of progressive labor to throw down to invest money because everyone was like, well, why should we? <laughs> it's a losing fight. We all know that, right? Why are we doing this? Because we're trying to move the needle so it's a 10-point a loss versus a 30-point loss. And so I think it's important for us as leftists to be like, who are the people we need to bring together? Because at the end of the day, we might have our internal squabbles, but those are not the enemies. So who are the people we need to just align? labor, community, democratic party forces, leftists, you know, teachers, nurses, like regular people. And so I think that's the hard part of like doing the coalition building and united front work is actually who can bring those folks together and so we can move together with more power. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go around the clock. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you to the, our panelists. I think, you know, I know I left the plenary with some thinking about some really big questions and I feel like dropping into these really specific geographic and issue based struggles has helped me feel more grounded in those questions that were raised earlier. So this was a really great next thing to get to be a part of. Um, so thank you all so much. Thanks to our support team too um, for making that happen. And thank you all for your thoughts and for being here. All right. Two forty. What an luxurious lunch. Are you here for this?